embracing the suck each time they step outdoors. Welcome to the Chronicles of the Kamikaze Duck Tribe. You know, um, we were talking just a few minutes ago, right before we were getting ready to record, and you had mentioned, I've got a teenager, guys, and um, it, it's a miracle that any of them actually make it to adulthood, and I, I wonder if they have that problem in the animal kingdom. Well, you know, probably at least not in deer, you know, that's that's why uh, uh, with many animals, the female's larger, you know, in Africa. Is it because the males eat their young? I I can imagine. And I I have to think that within our species, the ones that did not have that strong protective drive of children are the ones that did not make it. Yeah, I I would agree. So, now, this last week, you and I got the opportunity to do some hunting. Um, You know, all kidding aside, with, with the teenagers, and I'm not really kidding, any of you guys that have teenagers, especially female ones know exactly what i'm talking about but um this week you took us on a hunt um actually i guess the last two weekends to go hunt uh white tail deer yeah yeah we we uh were fortunate enough to do some archery hunting on just a little bit of private ground uh, which is different for us so that was really cool um worked on uh trying to trying to find them they were already there pretty well and and uh, we had some ground blinds set up so uh, neither of us had really hunted out of a ground ground blind much seems like i can't talk very well today <laughs> <laughs> i got up too early and uh and it was nice and absolutely um to the landowner just in case you're listening we do appreciate um the offer to let us come on your land It was definitely a a different experience. Any of you guys and gals that get the opportunity to hunt private know what I'm talking about. Usually the walk's a lot nicer. You're not having to fight for position. And stuff's already set up for you. You're not having to pack in all the extra weight of a ground blind, which we never do because you don't want to get shot out there. It's already hard (laughs) enough in public areas to not get shot. But Sitting out there, there's already a chair. All you got to do is make your way to the blind, try to be quiet, and just wait for the deer to come in, right? I mean, that that's all hunting is, right? Just just waiting. Sure, yeah. But we did we did uh, get to uh, put a new uh, the kamikaze duck uh, urine collection system in place. Oh, my God, that was so <laughs> damn funny. Typically, when you're out rifle hunting, we've all experienced it, and we've even talked about it on here there's always the need to use the restroom and luckily um brian had gone out the weekend before and figured out something that i hadn't thought about which is uh, where's all this coffee gonna go once your body is done with it and (laughs) what was it you did that first week go ahead and share it's kind of funny well uh, i got out there and and, uh, have a really nice yeti uh, coffee cup so uh of course drank all the contents of that and it had to go somewhere <laughs> so you can imagine you can imagine where it ended up uh, so i had to clean that quite well when we got back home and and i know it's probably psychosomatic but it would be very difficult for me to drink coffee out of that again because like man this tastes like piss this this tastes like piss and even if it didn't you would think it did <laughs> yeah. am i wrong uh, no, no, it's uh, it, but it was bleached quite well. <laughs> I can imagine so, but luckily for us, you brought out this patent pending urine reclamation unit, the Kamikaze Duck one, and um, I think yours was made by what company? I think mine was Folgers, and and the other one was Maxwell House. <laughs> exactly. Um, we brought out these uh, coffee containers, uh, the ones that have the snap seal lids on the top, and. I got to be honest, when you handed me the thing, I'm like, the hell is this for? I'm not going to sit out here and eat coffee. It was empty, of course, but it, it didn't take long for me to figure out the necessity of having said device. And those of you that bow hunt or that are into archery understand, uh, those of you that do not, scent discipline is at a very high priority. With a rifle, you know, you're engaging targets further than 300 yards if you want depending on the projectile and your ability your optics you don't have that luxury with archery am i right right yeah and most of the most of the shots that we get 
Uh, for me personally, I don't like to shoot much farther than 20 yards just because I suck at it. With archery. Right. Okay. I yeah. just want to clarify we weren't talking about rifle. So with that being said, like me, I, I'm a little, I, I'm not going to say insane about it. There are people that are even more intense about scent discipline than I, but I have a separate container. I keep everything in and I put those clothes on. I try to put them on when I get into the field. I uh, spray them down with um, some of these uh, scent blockers that mm-hmm. we have. I scrub my body with a scent reduction soap. I use scent-free uh, detergent on the clothes. We use scent-free deodorant. I mean, it's it's pretty intense. And even bring out the bottles. And while we were sitting in the blind, every 30 minutes, I was reapplying it to myself and around the blind. Now, the first week we hunted, you didn't do that. And you brought out your normal clothes. And what happened? Oh, yeah, I got busted big time. And, yeah, yeah that it, it, it's amazing. It, it won't happen every time. But if you're like me or if you're like <laughs> Brian, the winds always shift out of your favor. Right. So it's a good idea to at least try to be as cognizant of scent. What does this have to do with, with the containers? And the purpose of the containers was to have something to, of course, take a piss in and when nature calls you it's got to go somewhere and just pissing on the side of the blind is gonna do the opposite you spend all this time and even spent money buying scent blocker scent blocker um uh, clothing all this great stuff and taking a piss all over it is not (laughs) not gonna be productive well unless your goal is to not stick an arrow in a deer and then, then it's right on target. It's absolutely on target, which is kind of funny to to use that pun. But I'm not going to lie. When I opened the container, I realized what it was for. Open the container. That first time I had to go really, really bad. And it, it's interesting inside the ground blind. Because usually like, we rifle hunt. You go find a tree that's not in a heavily trafficked area. You look around, make sure there's no hunters, take care of business, get on down the road. But... With this, it's almost like a little bit of a dance because you got a chair and you've got a bow with a really sharp thing that point, a really sharp pointy thing on the end that you got to make sure goes <laughs> not where you least want it. And you've got to do this in such a way you don't make any noise. You limit the amount uh, of urine smell that you create. You don't want to make, and my wife absolutely loved it when I called it this, so I'm going to do it for her benefit. You don't want to make a lot of tinkle noises <laughs> <laughs> when, when you're actually filling said um, reclamation device. So it, it was interesting. Um, the first time I tried to use it, I tried to do it in a kneeling position, and I got Charlie horse cramps in both <laughs> legs while in the kneeling position. And if you want to talk about a guy that is praying for anything to happen other than what is going on in a kneeling position that was me that time <laughs> but but on the on the bright side at least it allowed us it allowed us to once again test the effectiveness of the dick call oh my god yes and i, I think the tinkling noise actually probably helps call them in yeah i'm guessing it's a lot like the bubbling stream that they love to take a drink from. But um, what Brian's referring to is it, the first day, and I'm going to back up here just a second. The first day we were out there and um, the only deer we saw, we didn't want to shoot at. So we came back for a second round and I, I've got to admit this. I, I've hunted several different animals, typically with firearms. If you get the opportunity to hunt archery, I cannot recommend it any higher because there is an adrenaline rush you get from it that you do not get from hunting with a gun. Now, don't get me wrong. I still shake when I've got a deer in my sights, which is why there's none mounted on my wall. (laughs) (laughs) Buck fever is a real deal. But I have never felt it more strongly than sitting in that ground blind with a deer 15 yards away from me. I mean, would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. You know, there's there's nothing like uh, watching that animal. You can you can see their whiskers twitching. You're close enough. So uh, I think it's a lot more up close and personal, if you will, with archery. Oh, my God, yes. I mean, it's almost terrifying how close it is. And 
what was cool for me is uh, on that first day when we saw the deer that you know we weren't going to shoot um by the landowner's uh, wishes after it left i i was shaking uncontrollably and it it was a good feeling but also a bad feeling at the same time and today we went back out with a different game plan and um a little wider range of what we what we decided we were or were not going to harvest and <laughs> but before we even had to um i don't know utilize this uh, reclamation unit i was sitting in the blind sun came up and uh, we had blue jays sitting at the feeder eating corn some squirrels coming down and the next thing i know they all just jumped up like what what the hell's going on and it's barely light outside and i look to my left um, and just past where the blind has its windows is that buck that we did not shoot at the first time and he is eyeballing the hell out of me <laughs> and like you said i can see the whiskers twitching this this dude's maybe 10 feet away from me and he's not happy <laughs> he doesn't know what he's not happy about but he's eyeballing me inside the blind and even though i know he can't see me or i believe he can't see me i swear to god he's looking right at me right through me like you son of a bitch what are you doing there and he walks in to the corn but he won't eat he just keeps looking at me and looking at me and i'm like okay maybe if i look away maybe if i i you, all kinds of crazy things go through your head while you're out there hunting you know like, like we have sometimes you can feel like someone's staring at you right. like well, shit maybe this deer knows that i'm looking at it so I look away, and no, it doesn't care. It, it it saunters off, doesn't give me a shot, and it moves on. Well, this guy comes in a couple other times, but will not come close enough to take a shot. He knows still that something's up, but he really wants his <laughs> yeah. corn. He's hungry. So with that with that lead up, once he went back into the, the trees, I'm like, okay, uh, you know, I've been shaken for about an hour, hour and a half. I've had to piss for about an hour, hour and a half. I've got to do this. So I turn around, grab the uh, Maxwell House <laughs> container. And what's funny is, you know, the thought of you, you smell the, the coffee that was in there. And it's almost like this ritualistic deal that, you know, for ashes to ashes, dust to dust kind of thing. You know, coffee to coffee. <laughs> to piss may we rust or whatever you want to say but it was funny just thinking about the fact that you've got um this coffee that you've filtered through your body and now going back into the container but sure as shit i'm sitting there and i've got my back turned to the window and well, i hear you, that sound you didn't want him to see you that, I, that's I, what it was you're shy i am shy i mean there was nothing to see i assure you it was pretty damn cold this morning but I hear the sound that all hunters love to hear, but we hate to hear when we are out out of, um, I don't know, out of pocket or we don't have a weapon in our hands and we have something else in our hands, which is <laughs> not, not a weapon. And I hear the ch 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 and I'm like, oh shit, no, God, no, it's not supposed to work during archery season. <laughs> and, um, sure shit, I, I, I had to stop midstream try to get the lid stamped on it as quick as i can as quiet as i can because it snaps I, I i don't even bother to zip <laughs> because those things make too much noise and i, I got a quick side note I, i'd be interested to hear from any of you guys have you noticed that the zipper or the fly hole in your layered garments never line up oh yeah yeah it's God, that sucks. That that gives uh, threading the needle an entire new context, if you understand what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to get it up and down and left and right to get it to where you could not pee in your pants. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty funny. But anyway, turn around very slowly. Still unzipped. Not hanging out, though. Of course, you know, it is cold, guys. You gotta have your priorities. And sure as shit, there's a doe with a yearling fawn sitting right there. Now, Brian is in a blind. How far away is that blind? Uh, about 30 yards. Now, not far away. I mean, but I know he probably sees this damn thing. And I'm like, you know what? 
we're not going to shoot does. We're of course not going to shoot the yearling for right. this particular hunt. It's we're not in the desperation side. <laughs> not, yet. not yet. <laughs> not yet. Soon. That, that, that's next weekend. But um, it was really interesting sitting there and like, okay, I could just kind of plop down in my chair or let's try to see what's going to happen. I, although I'm not going to shoot these two animals, is there a way to solve this situation? And you're sitting here and you're scooting around in, inside the blind trying to get to where you can sit down and pick up your weapon. And lo and behold, I got it done. They walked back in the woods just just long enough. I, I guess to take a gander at things and that's um when um I think they were closer to your blind. Right. Yeah, they were they were looking they they were nervous about something but they didn't know what. It was the size of the call. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> I doubt that. <laughs> but anyway, um they came they actually finally worked their way into the corn. I'm like, holy shit, you know, these two deer are sitting here, they're actually eating, which means they're they're comfortable. Right. Ish. And um I'm sitting there looking at those. I'm like, you know what would be really cool? And then I hear it. The sound of a buck coming in. Because we're still close enough to rut that he's interested. Mm -hmm. Even though there's a child present. (laughs) If you think about it, it's kind of weird. I didn't think about that till now. And I I get that feeling, guys. And I've, I've got a crossbow in my hands. Started out with a bow. We'll talk about that in a minute. And he's watching the blind. The doe's watching the blind, and this yearling is watching the blind. And I'm shaking. I'm not going to lie. I'm shaking my ass off, trying not to <laughs> make any noise. Well, you know what you know what he was saying, don't you? What was that? He said, is that an arrow in your hand, or are you just happy to see me? That's exactly what he was not saying. <laughs> not at all. And... I, I pick my shot, and those of you that, that hunt on a tree know that, especially if you see uh, a deer coming in, you kind of know the path they're going to take, and you know where you're going to take them, because you can't just draw back, or in this case with a crossbow, you just can't shoulder the weapon and take the shot anytime you want to, because they're going to see the movement. So you got to time it, you got to be careful, and I was going to have to... Unfortunately, we can bring this topic back up, but thread the needle in between two trees. And I knew that once he crossed the first tree, he wouldn't see me. I would shoulder the weapon, point between those as he stepped forward, pop him right between the shoulder, and then be puking by noon. <laughs> Gutting by noon. <laughs> right. but, yeah, puking by noon. You get you get the reference there. And I've got it all set up. I'm sitting there. I've got a smile on my face. Boom, his head appears. Right between the trees, he's still stepping forward real slow. One step, and he's got one more step left. And I will be goddamned if that damn doe didn't spook. She jumped right as I was pulling the trigger, spooked him, and I shot this deer in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a. <laughs> it's certainly not funny, but uh, yeah. <laughs> He should he should have just stood still, you know. He would would have been a lot better for him. It would have been a lot better for him. Oh my god, I felt so bad about this. But I'm looking, and I see him jump forward right as I'm pulling the trigger, and I've got it right behind his shoulder, and he leaps forward, and I stick him. And I don't know if it broke his leg. I I know it's stuck in bone from the sound it made. God, awful sound. Yeah, it was a, it was a solid smack. I'm like, okay, well, at least I got the deer. Maybe we'll be able to find him. He was dragging his leg. And unfortunately, that did not happen. So um, I, I will take a little chastising here. You know, we were talking about uh, proper shot placement. So <laughs> go ahead. You can go ahead and give me all the grief you wanted because in the ass is not where you want to shoot a deer. <laughs> no, although Fred Bear used to like to shoot him in the ass if he had a chance to. Really? But from the rear. Because it exposes some of the arteries. I did not know that. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Now, just so those guys, so our listeners can hear your voice, because I've I've been kind of droning on here for a minute. What was this story about you shooting one in the ass? I thought it was kind of funny. Good enough to share. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Probably 14, 15 years ago, um, I had a a small buck come under, under my stand not long. I used to shoot instinctively all the time. And uh, that particular year, I decided to use sights. So 
the problem with sights is it has to be light enough to see them well. And this was an overcast morning. And he came through right at shooting light. And uh, couldn't quite see the the sight pinned good enough, but I thought I was where I needed to be and, and uh, shot him right in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> and he he kind of crow hopped, looked around, looked back, saw that arrow, and he actually reached back and pulled the arrow out of his butt, <laughs> just spit it on the ground so I was good enough to get my arrow back. <laughs> and then he trotted off. No, uh, I... I would be happy I got my arrow back, but at the same time, if that's not a fuck you, I don't know what a fuck you is from the animal kingdom going, what's this? No, I don't think so. Here. Is that all you got? Yeah. Here, try again next time, buddy. Here you go. Now, something else funny. I I know we're the kamikaze duck tribe, but I got introduced to something um, far scarier, I think, this weekend, and it was kamikaze squirrel. (laughs) I'm in in this ground blind. And I don't know what pissed this squirrel off. I have no flipping idea. But the next thing I know, I'm just sitting there. It is quiet. So quiet. You know, you you can hear the wind barely rustling through the trees. You've kind of lulled yourself into that, I don't know, sense of peace that that comes from being out there hunting. And um, next thing I know, this damn squirrel lands on my ground blind and it is pissed off raising hell. I don't know if you guys have seen Blair Witch, the uh, the movie with the little kids' uh, hands hitting on the tent. That's what it was like with an angry squirrel. And I will tell you that if it happens to you, it can lead to premature dick call utilization. <laughs> yeah, and and your uh, the uh, urine retaining retaining system will not work in that case. No, it will not. No, that no, it will not. All right, before we go into some of the uh, lessons that we learned from the field, I figured it'd be a good time to uh, hear from our sponsors. Hey there, KDT family. I know you hear us talk about the tools that make the outdoors more enjoyable, but we want to take a minute to tell you about the app that makes this podcast happen, Anchor.fm. And like any tool we carry into the field, Anchor is reliable, versatile, and best of all, easy to use. If you want to distribute your podcast easily, without the suck, Anchor's got you covered. Want to make some money off your podcast with every download? Anchor has you covered. Want to have all the tools to record and edit your podcast at your fingertips? You guessed it. Anchor has you covered so that the only suck you have to embrace is in the outdoors. So go to anchor.fm and download the free app today and start your podcasting journey. All right, guys, we're back, and we figure we'll start this next segment with some interesting lessons that we've learned from the field, and hopefully we can save you guys some grief. Now, I believe, uh, I, I know for me, this is the first time I've ever utilized a crossbow. Right. Um, and I've never really, actually, I've never killed anything with a compound bow, but went out there with the intent of using one. Now, you've used one quite a bit. Right. What's, um, in your experience with compound bows versus crossbows, what are the big differences between the two other than obviously what they're, what they do? Yeah. The, the, the crossbow I, for me works a lot better out of a blind because mm-hmm. you know, it, it's, uh, a little bit more compact. Of course they make small compound bows too, but both of ours are, are pretty large. You know, mm-hmm. I have a, a Hoyt Alpha Tech, and I can't remember what you shoot, but uh, both of them are are pretty large bows. Mm-hmm. So you have to have a lot of room in order to to draw those things, and the crossbow alleviates that problem. And the the crossbow is more of it, it almost resembles a firearm with a, a bow attached to it because it's got a stock, it's got a trigger, and all you've got to do is already cocked. All you've got to do is point, shoot, and done. And then, you know, you shoot a deer in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. <laughs> Easy. But with the bow, and I tried with the bow, guys. I, I did. And, but in this ground blind, we're using some of those um, kind of fold-out chairs. Right. And although those work well with a crossbow, I found out much to my uh, dismay when I tried to draw this morning. 
that it does not work with a regular bow and you're trying to maneuver around and trying to get this bow drawn which they work great in tree stands because you've got all this room around you but mm -hmm. man that was a nightmare so if any of you guys are thinking about getting into archery w what would you suggest do you think a crossbow is easier to learn um you know it, it, to me it's there's just so many options it's a personal preference there's pros and cons to both of them um you know of uh, uh, i'm not really well versed with a crossbow but you know your follow-up shots should you need them are going to be i think a lot easier with a compound or a, a recurved or even a longbow mm -hmm. whereas with a crossbow you have to cock the thing which yeah, is it's a process right i can definitely see that now crossbows sh typically shoot faster than compounds typically right Correct. yes yeah they, they typically have a lot higher draw draw weight um, a little bit faster arrow speeds, although some of the compound bows will, will shoot comparable. Right. Um, and one of the other things, is, is it due, do you think, to the smaller arrow size? And they're called bolts? Yeah, a crossbow shoots a bolt, uh, whereas a, a traditional archery shoots arrows. Gotcha. And I, I, I've shot the traditional, and the one I shot today was uh, with a compound, but it was... Out of necessity, it was sitting in the blind, already cocked. I'm like, okay, I can't get this done with the bow. Luckily enough, the landowner had left one of those. And I'm very grateful that he did. And it was very much like uh, picking up a firearm. You just got to find the safety, which this one was in a weird <laughs> spot. It wasn't on the trigger. It was actually on the mechanism that releases the uh, the string. Right. And then turn on the sight, which he had um, like a holographic sight. And boom it's just like firing a firearm at that point other than traveling a lot slower but um the big thing for me and i'm almost leaning towards getting a crossbow as well if i continue to do archery is with traditional bow recurve compound doesn't matter this is something you've got to practice all the time in order to remain effective whereas with a compound bow it's so much like a firearm. I mean, yes, you should still practice, but it's not like drilling with a bow. What right. do you think? Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, uh, and it's it's just most of us are probably a little more used to firearms, um, mm -hmm. at least at least the the people that we run with. Yeah, absolutely. And so. it, it shoulders just like one got a trigger mechanism. But let's see, what were some of the other things we learned? Um, oh yeah, camouflage camouflage great in the field it's great to look like a tree when you're in the field <laughs> when you're in a ground blind that's painted black on the inside which they all are right doesn't work no you need to you need to have a all black if you're going to be hunting out of a ground blind yeah and i got to figure that out today um when the the light comes through you actually reflect light whereas the black background does not so although the the animal can't really tell it it's a human shape, which is something they fear. They know something's wrong. Right. You know, even if if you've covered your scent and you've done everything you possibly can to prevent them from knowing you're there, you're still as hell. If the blind is always there, they know what it looks like. And then if suddenly there's this big blob of light colored <laughs> shit inside, they get a little skittish. Oh, yeah. And, they, and these are animals that, you know, spend their lives in the wild you know looking for predators so mm -hmm. very much more in tune than than what we are or could ever hope to be you know it's a it, it's actually great you bring that up because that's, that's something i think i had to get over as well and maybe some of our listeners can can chime on, in on this as well but we have this tendency of looking at these animals as very simple very unintelligent very stupid I mean, how smart can you be if you run out in front of a damn semi? <laughs> right. You right. can't be very smart. But again, keep in mind what they're doing. They're not thinking about the semi. They're trying to get somewhere and we're the ones in the way. But when you're out, especially archery, but I, I've noticed the same thing even when I'm rifle hunting. They seem a hell of a lot smarter when you're <laughs> the one hunting right. them. Yeah. It seems like uh, everything is stacked against you, the hunter, and then everything is in their benefit. Now, granted, don't get me wrong, with a rifle, we can reach out a long way, especially if there's a field. But for the hunting style that you and I do, where it's usually very wooded, they seem to have the advantage. Oh, definitely. 
Now, um, we had already talked a little bit about scent this one, but you uh, reminded me of this story while we were on break, and I think it would be a really interesting one to show why we need to be concerned about this. Right. You know, early early in my archery career, um, I was hunting deer and on a, oh, it was at the edge of a hay meadow. So it was almost like the yard or like the place was mowed. The grass was really short. And, you know, I, this was in, in uh, the late 70s. So didn't really think much about scent control at that time. So I had leather boots on and walking to my blind. And I just took a direct route, walked right to it, got up in the blind, and I was hunting. And probably one or two hours after I'd already walked through there, a coyote come across. And he was just hunting mice or whatever he was doing. And the second that he come across my trail, he just bolted. So I knew he didn't see me. I was still two, three hundred yards away. And uh, as soon as he hit that that trail that I had walked on, he hauled ass. That's crazy absolutely crazy so it makes the um the folgers containers seem all that more <laughs> valuable <laughs> right the best part of waking up is pissing your folgers cup right <laughs> right <laughs> it's better than your yeti yeah i can only imagine and yeah i don't want to drink out of that hey, can no I, and by the way can i borrow yours no <laughs> next, you cannot we go out. <laughs> you cannot borrow my yeti Something else to add to the list from last time of things we do not allow other people to do while we're in the field with them, <laughs> along with not eating milk duds or whatever else. Now, we usually like to talk about, um, these are some good lessons, but some of the hunting philosophy from the tribe. And this one is one of the first times I, I've ever experienced this. So I'll kind of take the lead. I've never really hunted private land. I've gone out. Um, I've got a good friend of mine who has let me go out and um, I've hunted deer and I, I've yet to actually bring a deer home. He actually took me out bow hunting the first time. And that was also the first time I got in the tree stand. I hate heights. Still did it because, you know, you're out for the love of, of, of what you do. But I went out later with rifle season, shot my first deer with him, and unfortunately this thing had gangrene, some kind of disease going on, and he was literally walking dead. His uh, guts were hanging out before I even shot him. It, it was terrible. But we didn't really have that many rules. It's like, okay, just go shoot whatever's in season and you're golden. With this one, um, the landowner is trying to develop the land for future generations trying to call out some of the the trash deer right because uh, you know they don't travel i mean they travel but trying to remove from the genetic pool the animals that we don't want to leave in there or you don't want to see in the future because you know that stuff's going to carry forward right and i'm not going to lie not ha being a person that's not taking a deer and brought it home. You know, we've had our instances where I, I've shot animals with you and we were never able to find them. Kind of like today, which is kind of <laughs> making me wonder here if there's a trend going on. But anyway, it was very difficult for me to sit there with these animals just yards away. Literally yards away, broadside the flip of a safety pull of a trigger and it's over and it's done. But the landowner did not want those animals done. What, I mean, to you, what, what part of this, you know, respecting the wishes of the landowners, why is this important? It, it's kind of like, to me, it's like maybe your job, uh, for those of you that have been in the military, you know, to, to, to follow orders without questioning why, um, a lot of times at work, you know, you'll have to do things that you may not understand the why behind it, which would drive a, a Simon Sinek crazy. He's a, the author that deals with the why. Mm -hmm. you know, tell me the why. But in this in this case, you know, he, he doesn't want to shoot does, and I understand that because right now we're in rut, and if we shoot the does, the, the bucks will leave also. Mm -hmm. uh, but 
Also, it's important that, you know, the landowner's wishes are followed just so you still have access to that that property and they get the results that they're after. Absolutely. And it's a symbiotic relationship. It, it has to be. I mean, this this is their land. And the other side of it is, we all know stories of farmers or any or other people that are landowners that if any hunter approaches them to hunt, they go, no way, I don't want you on it. I have to believe that they've had a negative experience, whether it be some outfitter or some other people coming in, not following their wishes. Right. Over hunting, leaving trash, driving their vehicle on their crops. I mean, any mm-hmm. number of things that we could do. Right. To violate that trust relationship. And that's what it is. I think you'd use the word uh, stewards Mm -hmm. in one of our earlier episodes where we are stewards of the outdoors and even more so on um, someone else's private land. It is doubly important to leave this better than when we found it. It doesn't mean you need to go out there and build a habitat for humanity. That's not what I mean. You (laughs) you don't need to build a house. But... Before you go sawing down trees, before you go doing anything that's going to impact not only the landowner, but future generations of hunters, because all it takes is one bad experience. You know, someone is allowing you to utilize their land. And and in some cases, especially with this landowner, we're shooting at deer that he could harvest himself. Right. Yep. And. To all of you that do listen to this, it's very important to be cognizant of this fact that it's not just us that we affect, but it's also the other hunters. And if we are a tribe and we are working together, especially trying to foster this community uh, of hunters, of people that enjoy the outdoors, it's in our best interests to make sure that everyone else remains and and it remains to have access to it absolutely and um, i know we've mentioned this before but uh, the the department of wildlife and parks uh, right now has about one and a half million acres of of huntable property available to everybody and much of that is walk-in hunting and that stuff's really really critical that we we respect the landowners and the land when we're we're hunting those properties Right, and uh, like Brian's saying, the the walk-in hunting areas are not owned by the state. They're still owned and retained by the um, private landowners. And let's be honest, guys, um, if you were a farmer and you had an outfitter that was offering you ten grand, you know, for the exclusive rights for a, a, a parcel of land, or you had the state offering you pennies on that which one would you usually take right so it's really important if hunting is important to you if if the outdoors is important to you to really respect these walk-in hunting areas like we have here in kansas because it's not in the hunter's best interest now not the hunter sorry the landowner's best interest now granted you know it they get paid a little bit it probably helps them with taxes but Mm -hmm. Again, we, we've we all seen areas, you and I have driven around, where you know it, it'll be an area that you and I have hunted before, and then you go back out and there's a sign posted that says, um, uh, no trespassing, contact, blah, 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 outfitters. Right, yeah. And you're not getting on there for free. <laughs> no. No, not no, at all. No, and, and you know, they, they have to make a living, too. I understand Absolutely. that. So it's... And, wow. and some of these outfits do an amazing job. They even um, help develop the habitat so that it's uh, more preferential for these animals. Right. So I don't have a, a problem with that. You know, they're they're planting feed plots. They're throwing out corn. They're doing whatever. So and any of you guys that are outfitters, I'm not bagging on you by any stretch of the imagination. It just, it puts those areas out of reach for the common hunter. And that's right. kind of the the place we come from on, uh, on on this podcast is more about that. See, what else did we uh, learn? Um, I had a question for you, and I, I didn't give you a chance to prepare an answer. I'm, I'm interested to see where you go with this. Sitting in the blind today, um, usually with a lot of our hunting, you know, whether it be duck hunting, whether it be upland hunting, 
even deer hunting, usually we're all together, you know, at least in the range that we can sit and talk to each other where necessary. So you, you still have that input when you're sitting alone in a blind and you've got nothing, you don't have the phone. All you've got surrounding you is nature and, and what's taking place in front of you. Do you think that the reason a lot of people avoid this is they don't like the conversation that you're forced to have with yourself. And I I, I guess I'm assuming that you have a conversation with yourself, but like for (laughs) me in my mind, there's all these ideas and thoughts and you have no control over what's going on in your head because you've got no input, nowhere to focus your attention. So it's just kind of running amok. Do do you find the same thing? For me, no, but uh, I, I don't think that I'm quite the thinker that you are. Uh, I, uh, uh, I I find it very relaxing and, and calming, but there's there's something to that. I mean, that's why solitary confinement's considered such a, a, a bad punishment. Yeah, we're, we're social creatures. Right. Absolutely. And I wouldn't say you're not the thinker. For me, I'm just, I, I'm constantly going, run, 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 go, go, go. And it's not bad for me, but a lot of people that I talk to, like, man, that's boring. Just sitting in a blind all day. It's boring. I can't imagine sitting in a tree (laughs) or sitting in a ground blind for six hours without Facebook, without TV. I mean, you think about the the majority of our experiences as, let's just say it, animals. We have constant control over the inputs. You know, uh, okay, I don't like this music. Fast forward to the next one. Change right. the channel. Change the genre. I don't like this movie. I've got this. I've got that. We can control those inputs. And the inputs allow us to not think because they take enough of our attention. Right. But when there's no input, when there's no input, all you've got for me are the thoughts that are rolling around in your head. And it's, it's kind of like, um, have you ever practiced meditation or no, mindfulness? No, I haven't. One of the things in the beginning stages is you just breathe. Oh, you're like, okay, yeah, we breathe all the time. That's kind (laughs) of necessary for life. But you breathe in and you breathe out. And that's all you do. Breathe in and you breathe out and you focus on it. But the idea is not to let a single other thought creep up into your mind other than breath in, Mm -hmm. breath out. No thoughts. Yeah, that'd be difficult. It is impossible for somebody (laughs) like me. And when I'm sitting in the blind, of course, I'm supposed to be sitting here enjoying this experience. And I'm thinking, well, maybe that's what's wrong with so many people because I've got to have a conversation. I've got to talk. I mean, anyone that's listening to this podcast, like, Jesus Christ, would you shut up? You've been talking for three quarters (laughs) of the podcast. But, But even when I'm by myself, I'm still talking to myself and I'm thinking about all these different things like kamikaze squirrels and you know, (laughs) Folgers, urinal retention devices and all this other crazy stuff. But I've got to wonder if, um, you know, like if I took one of my daughters, even the oldest one Mm -hmm. who's used to having a book or a TV or a tablet or something, I can already hear it. Dad, I'm bored. Now your children grew up in an age before that. When you took them out, did you struggle with that at all or? No, not with, not with mine. Uh, but like you said, that was a different time. Uh, that was pre-cell phone, um, pre-common personal computers. Uh, I had a, a Commodore 64. Woohoo! Woo! <laughs> yeah, <wee>. that was... <laughs> I think some of the uh, bows and arrows that are out there now have uh, more computing power than that damn I, thing. I think you're right. Yeah. It was just interesting. It's something that struck me today as I was, of course, having the conversation with myself. And again, maybe this is something we can get from our listeners. But, you know, what do you think about while you're out there? What thoughts creep up in your head? And, you know, it's kind of fun, at least yeah. for me. Yeah, for me, it's it's usually an appreciation mm-hmm. of the beauty. I mean, the absolute stunning perfection of nature from, you know, like a the colors on a garden spider you know maybe the like today there was a granddaddy long legs crawling around inside the the blind and i watched him for 15 20 minutes thinking you know don't you know it's freezing out here why are you still moving <laughs> i'm freezing my ass off what are you doing alive 
But just looking at the legs and the perfection of how it's put together, it's just awesome. And that's cool. And, and it may be different for each person. Like me, I was looking for patterns. One of the things I discovered is, uh, at least with the, the current setup, you know, we have the Blue Jays that come in and the crows. Like today mm-hmm. was the first time I've seen crows come in. But um, watching the animals chase each other off as different groups would come in, you know, the birds would be in there. Then squirrels would come down pissed off that the birds are eating their corn, right? chase them off. But I could always tell something big was coming because the birds would all of a sudden all fly away. Yep. And you, I, I'm always looking for those patterns. That's just kind of how my brain is geared, I guess. And it was neat putting my finger on that to me. Um, Beyond that, uh, I guess the other big thing today that you and I discussed, and I think it's something that would be good to get on this podcast, and you, you kind of had to talk me out of this funk. It sucked. It, it sucked seeing that damn bolt stuck in that deer. Oh, yeah. And I don't know if it sucked more seeing it and knowing that I'd fucked up, knowing that I was going to get no end of shit whenever <laughs> <laughs> you and I got back together, or... You know, and it still bothers me now that I I know I did not ethically harvest this animal. And and we looked. We looked for a good hour, hour and a half, and some of the thickest, nastiest shit we've been in in a while. Mm -hmm. And found blood, found all that great stuff. It disappeared off into the sunset, as it were. But it's really tough. You know, we talk about embracing the suck, and a lot of that is the cold or having to pee in Folgers containers or... um, like the the really funny god it was like the damn three stooges i poured my first cup of coffee after my first piss trying to warm up and um i've got one of those stanley thermoses just like yours and i go and i pour it in the little lid that it has i'm used to having a yeti but i don't dare bring that out because i don't want to be tempted (laughs) to do what you did because I don't think I'll get that out of my head and I, I I fill the cup up and I'm trying to set very quietly the Stanley uh, thermos down and the handle on that is not designed for hunting it makes a lot of noise set it down gingerly of course you're leaning in at an angle I overfilled the cup so guess what happens boiling hot coffee on my crotch I'm like oh my <laughs> god that burns so you jerk and then It goes the opposite way, and it covers my gloved hand with boiling coffee. And I'm like, fuck, fuck, fuck. And so I kind of kick out instinctively, knock over the thermos. It hits the chair. (laughs) It makes all this noise. I'm like, god damn, it's not even 6.30 in the morning, and life is already sucking balls. (laughs) Now, that's the suck we talk about, but I think the one we have not talked about is the suck of failure. Right. And it's something we've got to embrace as outdoorsmen. And, you know, you and I were driving around after, after the hunt and I was down and you were trying to help me through it, but it was interesting. And I, and I do appreciate this very much where as outdoorsmen, we've got to kind of be support for each other. Cause it does. I mean, there are times you're like, fuck it. I'm done ebay here i come i am done with this bullshit but have you ever like felt like fuck it i'm done oh i've definitely been uh been upset about things you know the um and it's, it's usually if you hit an animal bad mm-hmm. you know wound one or don't make a clean kill that always bothers you Mm-hmm. Um, should always bother yeah, you i still you know i still don't like it if if you don't kill the ducks right out and you have to oh, you know have to God. put them out of their misery once you get them so um, i i think i think when that stops bothering you you need to start saying fuck it i'm done that's a good point i hadn't really considered that because like for me it, it's difficult to put them out of their misery it's a lot easier, especially to, to shoot them because there's a, a little bit of a disconnect, but it still bothers me to actually clean the animal. But you make an excellent point. If it no longer bothers you that an animal suffers, that you don't deserve right. to be out there. And the other the other thing to think about is at the end of the day, we're predators. And predators don't always make a clean kill. Sometimes they wound it and it gets away. 
What is your saying about results? <laughs> we're, we're only interested in results. Right. Yeah. And I mean, when I say we, I'm, that that's his saying. But you know, obviously, as outdoors people, we need to be very cognizant of our image. And, you know, some of these guys that go around parading stuff just to piss other people off it's dumb guys i mean you you we shouldn't go out of our way to bring discomfort to other people because that's not helping right bring more people to the outdoors i'm not saying go and hide everything but there's a difference between having a a gutted deer in the back of your truck and then taking it and parading around town and one of the, on one of those, uh, what are they hitch mounted gambrels? Yeah. The damn thing, you know, swaying in the wind, like a fucking yo-yo and you're going down the highway. Yeah. It doesn't make much sense. So as you said, being stewards of the outdoors, but I think it, it goes beyond just being out in the woods. Yeah. There, there has to be a, a love and a respect for your prey. There does. At that point, I think that would be a good place to wrap up, unless there was anything else you wanted to cover. No, I think uh, until we uh, get out next weekend and do it again. That does sound like, I was going to say fun, but I know better (laughs) if it's going to be you and I. And if any of you guys are thinking about trying to uh, capitalize on our new Folgers, um, your reclamation device, be aware it's patent pending, so don't even try. (laughs) So until our next episode, we'll see you then. See you later.